Amen. So this morning, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 1 to 12. We're going to be finishing off the Christmas story. We're going to finish off the Christmas story with the end of the birth and, and, and Jesus as a little child, uh, two years old. Uh, the story about where the Magi come, two years after the birth of Christ. And... Um, we're ending off our, our uh, series of Dreaming of a White Christmas. Today's topic being, I'm dreaming of a rewrite Christmas. And the question is, what if we rewrote the Christmas story? How would we rewrite it? So far in our series, for those that have missed, you can see these on YouTube. But uh, we started off with, I'm dreaming of an invite Christmas. You can see that on the board there. I'm dreaming of a bright Christmas was number two. I'm dreaming of a despite Christmas. Then last week, I'm dreaming of a right Christmas. And today, again, we're talking about a rewrite Christmas. Christmas is over. Christmas was yesterday, that's Christmas Day. And some people are very sad that that day has finished and gone, and some people are very happy and glad that it's over. And if you are dreaming of a rewrite Christmas, what would a rewrite look like for you? Um, would you even want to rewrite this last Christmas? Um, Rewrite what happened with family, rewrite what happened with friends, rewrite what happened with the presents. You might want to say, hey, pastor, I want to rebox it, I want to rewrap it, I want to regift it. I maybe just want to, I want to send it back to Amazon, they can have it back. And, um, you know, you might just say, hey, I, I want to change yesterday being Christmas, or I want to even add to that Christmas Eve. I want to change Christmas Eve, and maybe even today with Boxing Day, I want to change, I want to change, I want to change all of December maybe, because Christmas just hasn't been really that good for me this year. I just want to change things. There's always things that we want to change, right? Always. Even our Christmas. But today, what about the whole Christmas story? the story that we've been hearing for years and years and years, aren't there things that you would just love to change in the Christmas story? Aren't you tired of explaining to your friends at work or at school or out for coffee and, and that you say, no, no, I, I, I believe that, you know, she really was a virgin and got pregnant. Aren't you, aren't you tired of trying to explain the, the virgin birth? Many people I don't know about you, but many people ask me, you actually believe that, huh? You know, and, uh, and, and there's many, many answers, but that question is asked. Would you change, would you change, if Jesus came as a king, like I would like to change that my Messiah didn't come and be born in the midst of manure and cows and hay, in the manger. I, I, I would kind of like to change that. I don't, I don't like that thought for my king, my God, to be born in that way. Why did he come as a baby? Like, yeah, I mean, everybody starts as the baby, but why not just kind of start that story like they do in most other um, stories in the Bible where, you know, and suddenly there's this man and he comes and... Um, you know, he's a, he's a reformer. He, he starts the change. He needs to be a certain age to start that, to have influence. And so why doesn't Jesus' story, like, why can't we just have a start as a man? Why, at the birth of baby Jesus, why is his birth introduced amongst slaughter, amongst Herod killing kids two years old and under in Bethlehem. Why? why? Like, why does the King of Kings story have to have this kind of stuff aligned with it? You know, I think I was a, I was a realtor for a bunch of years and 
pastoring a bunch of years. And, you know, in real estate, you got to figure out how to, how to advertise your properties in the proper way. And, and, you know, I think God could have done a better job at advertising the King of Kings coming to the earth to be amongst us. The royal visit. I think he could have done it better. Um, don't you think that the, the Son of God maybe should have come like God has spoken in the different parts of the Bible, that he will come back where every eye is going to behold him. He's coming as a conqueror. Uh, there's going to be the heavenly host army that is coming behind him. He's going to be the rider on the white horse. Judgment is in his hand. His enemies are going to be obliterated. Like, isn't that the way the king of kings should have come on that first Christmas? But you know, if you look at the big picture, if I was actually able to change the story, if I changed the things that I wanted to change in the Christmas story, that would make me God. And lucky for you, I'm not God. But there is someone in the Bible that tried to play God. And it was a couple years after Jesus was born. And today I wanna talk about him a little bit the man who tried to rewrite Christmas. In your PowerPoint, on your PowerPoint, Matthew chapter two, we all know the story of the Magi, how, he, how they visited King Herod. In Matthew chapter two, it says this, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born the king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. You know, I, I know there are things about the way God has chosen to do things that for us are kind of hard to explain. But then again, if everything that God did was, um, everything that God did and everything about God was easily explained, I'm not sure that he would be the God that I would want to serve if he was a God that could be explained by mere human brains. The Magi ended up showing up in Jerusalem looking for this baby king. And when, it, when we come to advertising, when, when God advertising the birth of his son, this, these Magi coming these two years later is kind of the end of a long list of advertising that God did to get the world's attention. Throughout the Bible, God did all these amazing things all pointing towards that Christmas, all pointing towards the Messiah. He did prophetic things. He did powerful things. Over and over and over, he spoke to his people and challenged them and tried to get them on the right path. In fact, the whole story of the Bible is God's love story to us. The whole story of the Bible is God just wooing us back to him. The Bible is full of creative, magnificent advertising over thousands of years from God. But what about advertising of just about the Christmas story? You know, would, would we rewrite how it was done? Did, he, did God not do a, a really good job? Well, you know, in a lot of ways, he did a great job. There are so many prophecies about the virgin birth, where Jesus was to be born, that the government was going to be on his shoulders, that the babies were going to be slaughtered, and all that kind of stuff. There were angel visitations. Mary saw an angel. Joseph, Zachariah, the shepherds, they all saw angels advertising the Christ. And you know, good news travels fast, even in, in bad situations. And when the Jews were exiled to Babylon, that is where the, the, uh, the Persians would have gained, and the Babylonians would have gained um, interest in the, Jew, in the Jewish faith. And these prophecies from way back then were probably the prophecies that caused the Magi then, in Jesus' day, to come and seek him out. Generations later, 
They followed the star. The, they followed the king star, the Christ star. They followed the Bethlehem star. And it came and rested over Jesus' home, maybe when he was about two years old. If we talk about advertising, like God did so many things. And we think about the star. God set that solar system in order. It, 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 like he set a clock so that just at the right time, the alarm is going to go off, that the star is going to beam bright, that the magi could see that and know it is the Christ star. It is a star of the king, and it's going to lead us to this baby. And you know, if God didn't pop that star into the cosmos when he created heaven and earth, if he didn't do it at the creation, at the beginning, then instead he did a real cool miracle where he just poked his finger in the night sky at the time when he wanted the Magi to come and find the Christ. And he let, had that star put there just at the right time and it led them to Jerusalem and to King Herod. Prophecies, solar systems, angels in the outfield, <laughs> God did an amazing job of advertising his son coming to this earth. So I think in that way, if we thought about rewriting that story of the, the Christmas, I think we might have to give God a pass on that one, that he, he did do an amazing job. The next PowerPoint, verse 3, says, When King Herod heard this about the in infant king being born, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. Verse 5, in Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. You know, these verses say that Herod was disturbed when he heard the news, and all Jerusalem with him. Herod is freaked out. We can understand that because he wants, he's a king. He wants to hold on to his power, and someone is introducing a new king. We understand why he was disturbed. But why was all Jerusalem disturbed? They had been praying that there would be a Messiah coming. They were, they were asking God for a deliverer. They were in bondage to the Romans. But you know what? They knew that with every change of power in that Roman structure, people died. That, that bloodshed would be happening, and most likely it would be theirs. And so they were just as concerned as Herod was. Herod was, Herod was a smart man. But the news really bothered him. And I think it, it did bother him because he was smart. He knew something was coming. Herod was also kind of nuts. He was a little bit out there, a lot. And how do we know this? Well, if you look back in some of the history books, you can see that eventually in his reign, he, he eventually killed his wife and he killed his sons and he killed his relatives because he assumed that they were plotting against him. And when his coffers ran low, he executed 45 of the wealthiest people in Jerusalem and seized their properties so that he could pay those bills. We know this because he had all the baby boys in Bethlehem, he had them killed, the ones that were two years and under. It was probably about 30 of them. And, and he had them killed uh, because he was trying to kill Jesus. I don't know if I like that part of the story. In fact, I know I don't. I, I wish that that wouldn't be part of the story. Why do people have to die to usher in a deliverer or a Messiah? But you know, throughout the Bible, we, we see it tends to be that way. God seems to step in in answer to our call to him, in answer to our prayers to him. He steps in. And even when he, he steps in, there is evil all around us, and that is usually why we are calling out to God, because things have gotten so bad. 
And evil is always opposed to God's answer. Jesus in the New Testament even says to the, the Pharisees that uh, you are, you, your father is the devil. And so the, the evil we know comes from that side, from the devil. Evil loves oppression. They would, evil would love to keep the Jewish people in oppression. If there was any time that the devil and the oppressors were to fight against God, it would be at this time when the one who has been born king of the Jews has arrived. I'm not fond of death. I would love to rewrite a part of that story. But I am fond of deliverance. I am fond of being delivered from bondage. I'm fond um, of being delivered from the clutches of the devil. I am fond of being delivered from oppression or to help people be delivered from that. I am fond of that. And all of that comes for our sakes. And then there's a battle. And then we see death. So, because I'm fond of all that needs to be done, I guess I'll give God, I'll leave that one to, in God's hands. Uh, verse 7 in the PowerPoint. Then Herod called Magi secretly and found them and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he said to them, to, sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. It's interesting in this one part of the Christmas story, just this one part about the Magi, Herod, Jews. The Magi, they, they believed that there was a new king of the Jews that had been born. And they went, and they followed the star, and they worshipped him. That was their response. The Jews, when Herod says, hey, the Magi are here, and they're saying there's a new king of the Jews, and, and the, the Jewish people, he goes to them and says, what do you know about this? Where is this guy going to be born? And they know the prophecies. They look them up. They tell King Herod... The Jews believed that there would be a new king of the Jews. They gave their, their understanding of the prophecies to King Herod. But the Jews would have preferred to rewrite the story also. They weren't interested in having it happen like it was. They wanted a man. They wanted a warrior. They wanted a conqueror. Jesus' own people didn't go out to see the baby in Bethlehem. Just a few shepherds did. And then we have the king, King Herod. He also believed that the king of the Jews was born. He knew, we see from our verses, he says, so that I too may go and worship him. We, he knew that this king was to be worshipped. And King Herod did seek him out. But King Herod sought him out to kill him. He wanted to rewrite Christmas. He wanted to change what was happening. You know, I wonder today, where, where do we stand? Which, which one of these three would we identify? Would we be like the Magi? We, we follow what God has shown us so that we can worship Jesus? Would we be like... The Jews, that, hey, we have, we have the knowledge, right? We have the, under, we have the Bible, we understand, but we're just choosing not to follow and not to worship? Or are we like King Herod where, yes, I know that's the king, I know that's the way it's going, but I am going to try and stop it. Where would we stand? I wonder sometimes how it should be for today. You know, we are over 2,000 years later. Should it, be, should it be changed? Should the Bible be changed to catch up with society and, and what's going on today? You know, maybe we'll say, hey, um, pastor, I, I would like to be God. I, I would like to, you know, let me just take that Bible and push it to the side and let me come up with my own version of my religion and do what I feel is right. 
Maybe you're not saying that. I don't really want to be God. No, pastor, I would just like to take the Bible and I'd like to scribble out just a few, few portions here and there. I don't like some of those portions. They're not, they're not good. They, you know, like, I don't agree with them. Um, let me scribble some of that out. Pastor, there, there's so many things in the Christmas story that it needs to be rewritten. There's so many things in the whole Bible, for that matter, that should be rewritten for today's society. It's such an old book. And we, and we go on and on like that. On the next PowerPoint, I, I, I quickly looked up on, in Google and uh, to see some headlines about rewriting the Bible. And the first one, they're like the top 10. I rewrote the Bible to be gayer. And everyone got mad at me, was the, was the headline. I, I can understand that. Number two was why Thomas Jefferson rewrote the Bible without Jesus' miracles and resurrection. These are just headlines. I didn't even look further. Number three, China to Christians. We're rewriting the Bible and you'll use it or else. Number four, I rewrote the Bible. Just kidding. I didn't really rewrite the Bible. Well, sort of, but not really. And the fifth one, rethinking faith in the church. Let's rewrite the Bible. We don't really want to rewrite the Bible. But in practice, I think we do. Because we like to skip parts, leave out parts that we just don't agree with. I don't like the idea of hell. Let's, can we just erase that a little bit? We all go to heaven. That would be the better way. Or, or Jesus says there's only one way to heaven. I like to scrap that. You know, like, there should be many ways. Come on, God. Like, what are you doing? Or, Pastor, I don't believe, these are all comments that people have said to me. I, I don't believe there is a devil. There's no fallen angels. There's just good angels. Or, if I'm good, God should let me into heaven, right? That's the way the Bible should be written. Pastor, the Ten Commandments, aren't they really just suggestions? Like, do we really have to obey them to the, to the letter of the law? Aren't they just, you know, try and be good sort of thing? If God is love, I love this one. If God is love, so if I make love with my girlfriend, like, that's godly, right? Right? Or, Pastor, I, you know, I don't agree with the word sin. How many of you guys have heard these things? All right? Like, I, I get this all the time. I, I don't agree with the word sin. I, I think that should be taken out of the Bible. It's simply just you make good choices or bad choices. It's not evil. It's not sin. Or, Pastor, the Bible is a good book. Man, that has good morals in it, but really nothing more. It's, it's, Jesus is just a mythical being like Santa, and, you know, that's in there to, to make kids good. And people love to put their spin on the Bible and, you know, and, and do whatever it takes to, they want to be saying about themselves that really, I'm a good person. I am spiritual. I deserve to go to heaven and not hell. Except that God has given us his word and he's spoken it very clearly about how his creation needs to serve him and please him in this life. Who are we to rewrite Christmas or rewrite the Bible? You know, we would have to be, to rewrite the Bible, we would have to be so smart Someone has said that, man, I've said, this to, I've said this to people as I watch. You know, they say, yeah, I, I, I'm a Christian. I follow the Bible. Not everything in it, just the parts that I like. And then I've added some things from this religion and from that religion. And I say, wow, you are so smart. I am just in, in awe of you. And they're looking at me like, what are you doing? 
right? Uh, yeah, you are so smart that you can do that. Like I'm thinking if you have 0.001% of all the knowledge of the whole world, right? And I think that would be an exaggeration that any person would have 0.00001%. But if you had that much you might be able to, of all the knowledge in the world, you might be able to rewrite that Bible. Like, because that's a lot of knowledge. But sir or ma'am, trust me, you don't have that much knowledge. You just don't. And we are not qualified to rewrite this book. Verse 9. It says, after they had heard the king, this is the magi, they went on their way, and the star that they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with, with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him, and they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so the star led them to Jerusalem. And the Magi got to Jerusalem, and they stirred up a whole bee's nest. All of Jerusalem was going crazy with the news. Not crazy celebration, but they were upset. And then the star went ahead of them and brought them to Bethlehem. Stopped over Jesus' home. Here he's about two years old. He's born in a barn. He's laying in a manger. I don't know what your thoughts are about the Christmas story. There's, there's views here and there on it. Born in a cave, born in a barn, possibly in a house that had, that had animals in the house. There's lots of different thoughts. But there were animals at the Christmas story. There was a manger at the Christmas story. And the birth of King Jesus happened around that. It was smelly. It was animal smelly. It was poopy smelly. You know, you see this manger scene back here? I like, I like this. Doesn't smell at all. It's a nice story. It, you can picture it here. Um, you know, here is the donkey, but there's no little droppings behind it. It is a nice story. The tree's not staying up. I like our manger scene, every manger scene. It's perfect. It's so pretty. It's so nice. There's no cow manure. The animals don't stink. And you know, I bet you, I bet you, with our, the way we see our, our scene like this, I bet you Jesus never pooped his diaper. I, I just... Because he was godlike. He was kinglike. He probably just held it. No crying he makes, the Bible says, right? Or, the Bible doesn't say that. That's a song. He had diapers. He cried. He did all of that. And he's still a king. Our King Jesus was born in a stable, and it wasn't pretty. I'd like to rewrite that part. He should have been born to some of the wealthiest people in Jerusalem, um, maybe to a king even. And I think then, you know, he probably would have been one of those, those uh, few good Jewish kings it, we see in the Old Testament where they honored God and they turned people's hearts back to God. They brought reform. They put the people on a right path. They defeated the enemies. This was God's man of the hour and God was honored by this person. I, I think that's how Jesus should have come in. But you know, I realized long ago there's got to come a time when I say God, I don't understand everything that you have done. But God, I know that you, you, you've got this. I don't understand, but you've got this. I trust you. God, I've seen so much evidence 
of how you have done it right and how you have impacted this world, you've got this. I can put my trust in you. There's enough evidence without me understanding everything, Lord, that I can trust you. God, if you want to have a poopy stable for your son to bring in the Messiah, who am I to say that I should rewrite it? Our last PowerPoint, verse 12 says, And the Magi, having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Herod wanted to rewrite Christmas. And as we look back, you know what? Church, we don't have to worry because God has it all under control. Even today. Today, we, sometimes we think, you know, things look kind of nasty. But you can know that God has it under control. He, he's got it. And we can put our trust in him about that. We just need to stick close to him this Christmas and this 2021 and jumping into 2022. We just need to stick close to him and hear his heart and hear a word from him and allow him to to challenge us along the way and for us not to say hey god i'd like to change some things in the bible I, god i i, I want to just live it my way I'll, I'll you know i'll i'll do some of it but not all of it you know god is such a big god he lets us do what we want but he calls us to follow him like he has laid it out God has put the cosmos in order, and he has put each one of our lives in an order. And God calls us to step into his plan. He has a plan for each one of our lives. And to, and to stay in that plan, we need to stick close to him. Search him out. Be like the wise men. Follow that star. Worship him. Give him gifts. Give him your life. And he will guide you, each one of us, every step. I don't think there's any need to rewrite the Bible or rewrite the Christmas story. Worship team, would you come? Father God, I thank you. Lord, we don't understand why you did things the way you did it, but we know that you are God and you do it right. And so we put our trust in you this morning. And Lord, this morning, if there's someone here that doesn't know you, thank you for tugging on their heart this morning. I pray, God, that each one of us would give our lives anew this morning to you, this day after Christmas, re-realizing that, Lord, we don't need to change the Bible or the story you have done it right. Lord, help us, each one of us, to follow it like you have laid it out so that we can know the plan for our lives and glorify you in it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.